some movies are unstoppable, you know? No matter the genre or the original language or how old they get, some movies just perfectly capture what it is that humans appreciate about being human. Some movies just tell stories so well with such compelling characters that they will live on for as long as humanity itself. The other day, I was going through my friend Tad's video library, and I found one movie that rightfully faded out of existence on VHS. Extract from police report number 727A, strictly confidential, unpublished, and unavailable. Subject, Sandy Fremont. So we start off with some rando reading to us from an unavailable police file. I'd ask how he got it or why he's availing it to us, but I think we already know the answers to those questions are fuck it. The last positive sighting of the child was on her way home from a school orchestra rehearsal. This was on Tuesday, May 14th at approximately 6.30 in the evening. At about this time, her friend Janie Carr places her positively as entering the footpath through the area known as Crombie Woods, a then popular shortcut for several of the students living in Millard Heights. One, the last time anyone saw her, she was alone walking through a place so popular there was no one there to see what happened to her. Two, don't say orchestra. Uh-huh. Sandy was a popular girl and a rising star with the school orchestra. One! Sandy was so popular, she vanished while trudging through the woods in total solitude. Two! Thank you for saying orchestra correctly. Kid, you can walk away from the disembodied voices of the forest sirens any time now. Sandy. <laughs> mm. Okay, maybe the forest sirens are more persistent than I thought. Okay, then. And not only was she ripped into the woods by a roaring invisible force strong enough to blow her shoes off, but it went to the effort of taking her violin out of the case just so it could crumple it up like a paper ball. These woods are awesome! These woods are terrifying! Why was this a popular place for kids? Anyway, three years later, we get to see the outside of the school. And the inside of the school and more of the inside of the school, and then students walking inside the school. Police report number 727A, update. You mean after two minutes of nothing, we get a narrated update on that police report that isn't available? Cool storytelling! Shortly after the tragedy, a substantial metal railing was erected to seal off and stop the children using the Crombie Woods shortcut. Someone put a metal railing around the woods? Couldn't they just climb over it? And since then, speculation about Sandy Fremont's disappearance has been endless. But the truth, as elusive as ever. The conclusion is... 
Oh, you're still going. I was wondering. Although local stories of kidnapping, even of witchcraft and alien forces, continue, it is felt that there is strong evidence that Sandy Fremont was murdered without apparent motive by an immensely powerful psychopath who will undoubtedly strike again for equally unfathomable reasons. This is an educated town. All we've seen is a massive middle school, and yet the most noteworthy local theories are witches and aliens. And with three years without finding a body, the police themselves are going with murdered by serial killer who hasn't killed anyone else, but we're pretty sure will any day now. So, witches, aliens, and homicidal maniacs are all viable possibilities. <laughs> That's what it sounds like. This whole town sounds awesome. We now meet our main character, Ian. His car broke down, and he's renting one from the dealership because he's going out of town for work. Mark, tell me something. As a, a father of three strapping girls, how, how should I approach destroying a 14-year-old's dream? Tell her the truth. Her dream is dumb, and nothing matters. She's a sensitive kid, artistic. She always has been. But quite apart from that, she worships you. Perhaps a little too much. And that makes you both vulnerable. Oh. Uh, what? Of course she worships me. Still only a child. Uh, please don't be so smug about your teenage daughter being into you. Hello, Moppet. Joanne, Daddy, please. Oh, sorry. Sorry, darling. Sorry. Mm, forgot. Sorry. What's happened to the car? Well, it's still being serviced. But as I need another one at the crack of dawn tomorrow, I thought I'd hire that. Where are you going? I thought you were home tomorrow. The hell is wrong with her? What do you mean, Gothar? She's totally acting like a normal person who's not completely trashed. You remember I told you about the explosion and our big installation? A lot of men were hurt. Well, I have to be at the inquiry. Uh, it's, it's outside London, you see. It, 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 it's several hundred miles away. So I, I probably will be away overnight. Joanne, it wasn't planned that way. It, it wasn't going to be going, be going there at all. It was, it was going to be my partner, Tom. But about an hour ago, we, we, got, this, we got this telephone call. Daddy, tomorrow of all days, how could you? Joanne. So, she's in love with her father? <sighs> Moving on, Ian and his wife then have a conversation about their daughter's pretty obvious weirdness relating to being a child prodigy and social recluse. It's nothing. I mean, she's always been like that. She's never been a very good mixer, has she? I mean, ever since the very beginning, she's always enjoyed her own company more than anybody else's. Her own fantasies, more like. So what does that mean? She's a dreamer, love. You don't know her. You're not around her as much as I am. Oh, come on, that's not she fair. She lives in a dangerous world of make-believe. It's hardly dangerous. Look, let, let, let's just leave it alone. No, 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 no. You no, said it was dangerous. No, let's leave it. But th there's too much else to think about. Ian. I'm desperately trying to convey to you that I'm afraid our daughter is growing up to be an absolute psychopath. Also, never mind. And then we see the kid weeping over an entire photo album of romantic memories with her dad. So that's normal. Daddy, why is it you has to go tomorrow? I told you, darling. I'm standing in for somebody. <clears throat> Do I hate her because she's an annoying character, or because she's a terrible performer? <laughs> Both. <clears throat> now you'll just have to accept it this time. Now go on. Go to bed.
you hadn't you heard your mother? Don't I listen to you anymore? By the axe of Nork, they're fucking, aren't they? Anyway, Joanne whines some more and Ian sternly tells her to knock it off and go to bed. Then, while he's locking up for the night... Gee, why would he want to go into his daughter's bedroom in the dead of night? And why would she be lustfully awaiting his arrival? It doesn't matter! He goes to his own damn bed! And then he has a dream in which his wife is replaced by his daughter. I wonder if they're trying to tell us something. Then shit gets really weird. In the real world, we see a trio of Rottweilers arrive, we see Joanne asleep in bed, and then a photo of Joanne decides it also wants to watch Joanne sleep, and then we see their rental in the garage kick its headlights on. What the hell is happening? Ian's dream continues with him driving through the countryside for way too fucking long, of course, until a Rottweiler jumps on the hood and, nearly crashing the car, wakes him up. So, was the vehicle telepathically warning him that there were stray dogs on the property? After popping some sleeping pills, Ian zonks in the living room and one of the dogs lets itself inside. He then wakes up to the sound of heavy paws on the hardwood floor, but just kidding, flower petals make the same fucking noise! But... So this is all real now, right? He's not dreaming the vanishing dogs and the dying plant. And now they indicate Ian's wife is having a dream, apparently finishing the nightmare that woke Ian up in the first place. No. <laughs> this movie has a lot of questions to answer. <laughs> um. From the moment Ian creeps outside his daughter's bedroom to the moment he's dressed the next day took 26 minutes. <sighs> this is not a film that uses its runtime wisely. The next morning, Ian leaves without waking the ladies and, more impressively, without seeing part of the car in a fresh oil puddle in his direct line of sunlit sight. Also... Good to know the dealership keeps their rentals in tip-top fucking condition. After driving for who knows how long, he decides to take a coffee break, and if you thought extensive driving scenes were a thrill ride... Wow! Made it by the skin of his teeth! I'm gonna need a breather after that one. <sighs> Didn't the narrator say something about aliens? <clears throat> Wait, where'd the narrator go? Then, and I'm not going to make you sit through it, but just know that we get two and a half solid minutes of Ian sipping coffee, reading the paper, and glancing out the window.
I don't know why this is on film. Also, the mechanic discovers that the problem with Ian's car is the same piece that had fallen out of the rental. Eerie. Is it? Oh, and speaking of those haunted woods... After Joanne's gone to school, we see the crazy moving photo of herself and her father, along with some of those concerning love letters, are crumpled up in the fenced-off footpath. Oh, so, like, she dumped her dad, then? Looks like! Anyway, after 30 more seconds of driving footage, Ian decides to pull over. Anyway, anyway, back to the dealership, Watch his fuck is back to work on Ian's car. But as Ian decides to stop dicking around and get back on the road, the very first interesting thing happens. For some reason, while attempting to start his rental, the key is moving in his actual car. Okay, that's intriguing. But what's the connection here? Like, what happens if Ian's car actually starts? <laughs> Shit. <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking. Why did one car start the other? Why is this the only time that happened? Why were Ian's keys even in the ignition? What part of the engine is going to blast a screwdriver through a human skull? Yeah. Since he already stopped for coffee and then stopped to putz around, Ian decides to stop again and bullshit with his wife. Oh, you are making good progress then. Leaving early was a, was a very good idea. Especially since you keep stopping every five minutes. Drive carefully, won't you, darling? Well, after last night's dream, you can be sure of that. Last night's dreams? Well, I dreamt that I crashed the car. And you know what they say. Better not dream and drive! <laughs> During this pointless conversation, Ian takes off his watch for seemingly no reason, and soon after a truck with three giant Rottweilers passes the phone booth, Ian is back on the road. <sighs> Driving right behind the truck with three giant Rottweilers on it. He then passes the truck with three giant Rottweilers on it. And not once does he notice this and say, gee, what a fucking coincidence. And finally, after three solid minutes of driving. Damn telephone box. So last night during his dream, Ian's watch stopped because horror cliché. Why then would he turn around and impede his progress on a several hundred mile trip for a broken fucking watch? Well, why do you think? Because every action this man takes, every minor event in his life, must center around the deeply troubling stranglehold his daughter has wrenched around his twisted heart. Ha! <laughs> minor event. Ugh. On the way, the dog truck jump scares him, and with no brake fluid left, Ian finally crashes. Now... I've been complaining a lot about this movie having huge swaths of nothing and being generally confused about its paranormal element. But this part here, this part, is genuinely brilliant filmmaking.
What? Simply visionary. That wasn't physics. You know, they say this one scene inspired George Miller's entire film career, and I can certainly see that. <clears throat> I hate you. You give Roland Emmerich a thousand years and a million Disney monkeys, he couldn't touch the truth and authenticity in that <clears throat> one moment. I seriously hate you. Magical. But don't worry, Equalizer fans, he's not dead yet. Just like in his dream, his car's trapped upside down in a tree. Although it does look like his ankle snapped, and his arm is slashed, and his hand is trapped under the back of the seat. Wait, how did that... You know what? Whatever. Luckily, a very nice man happens by. If you can hear me, hang on! I'm going for help! Okay. Now, we have discussed Ian's shortcomings when it comes to noticing the world around him. And yes, he's dazed from the crash, but he does know three things. One, he's in a tree. Two, he's upside down. And three, the car's weight has been shifting. So maybe the last thing he should try to do... <laughs> said to hang on! And of course, the last shot of the movie serves only to confuse things even further and, naturally, goes on much longer than is necessary. So, the daughter is friends with the ethereal beasts. Did she send them to his dream to warn him of his doom? Is that why she was nagging him to stay home and attend her concert? <sighs> Look, there's a lot of shit to question in this movie, so I'm going to try to streamline it into two major categories. Things that are pointless, and things that make no sense. Oh, good. Things that are pointless. The flower petals, guys cutting concrete, killing the mechanic, the guy stopping to help, the moving photograph, the dog logo, the guardrail, landing in a tree. Oh, that was quick. Well, those were the quick items. The entire beginning. You show some girl that is never mentioned ever again in the film who gets sucked into the trees by disembodied voices three years before this movie starts, and it's narrated by a total stranger who vanishes the same time she does. No one dies the same way, we never even go into the damn path again, and not a single person brings up witches, aliens, serial killers, or even name drops the Crombie Woods. Cut this out, and the movie would be just as complete and exactly as confusing as it already is. But perhaps the most pointless thing is the entire third of the movie that is the dream foretelling Ian's misfortune. He retains almost none of it the next day, and what he does recall affects him zero percent. Why give your main character a premonition of that magnitude only to have him disregard it in its entirety. <clears throat> Things that make no sense. The rental car turned on when the dream started and turned off after Ian woke up, but it didn't turn on when Diane dreamt the end of the dream. And why would she get it anyway? The dogs are real, but they're also dreams. So I guess they're demons that move between worlds, but they never like bite anyone. So apparently they took the form of dogs purely to reference the logo on the truck which Ian never noticed. Also, why set up Sandy being attacked by forest sirens to then have Joanne talking to dream dogs? Why is Joanne even there? It's not a shortcut anymore. 
And why the fuck is this called the appointment? Is it a reference to the appointment he's driving to that he never actually reaches? Because the movie's not about that, is it? Is it a reference to missing the appointment to watch Joanna's concert? Because that's kind of a stretch. Is it a reference to his apparent appointment with Dev? Because he didn't exactly have that one written down for the day, did he? You know, for a movie in which damn near nothing happens, this one certainly leaves a lot of questions in its wake. But as we all know, the most important question for a movie like this is Tad. Where did you find this?